Hello everyone, welcome to PHTV Channel 4 in Palis Heights. I'm Sue Jankowski and we are back with our monthly show, The Travel Show. This show, I think hopefully you all look forward to so much because I sure do. We get to find out where we can go next, dream big, plan ahead. And we're so lucky to have Kathy James here with us from Class Act Travel, who always brings us a guest. Kathy, thanks for coming in today. Thank you, honey. It's great to be here. It's always so nice. And we have a guest today, of course, as we always do. We have Glenn Eastwood here today. Glenn, thanks for coming in. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be here. Thank you. Glenn comes to us from, I'm going to try and get this right, <laughs> Herdegruten. Ah, very Is good. it good? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it's very good. It's, uh, I feel like I should do it like with a little bit of an accent, you know, her de uh, <laughs> <laughs> If I got the right country, I'm not sure. But uh, I, I think Glenn is going to tell some really interesting things about expedition uh, cruising, which, you know, I know you know about cruise ships and big and little cruise ships. I think this is a little bit different. Am I right, Glenn? This expedition cruising is something else. Yeah, we're a lot different. We're not your traditional cruising where you're you're going to go to another over-touristed destination. You pull up to a touristic uh, cruise port with you know people trying to sell you things and Diamonds International <laughs> and nothing against those places. Oh, those fun. <laughs> but, but we're a different style of cruising where we go to some of the most pristine, untouched and uninhabited places in the world. Uh, places where there are no ports, there are no towns, there's no place for us to pull up to. So we visit that those places expedition style. So we have a, a, a special um, special ships that are purpose built for expedition travel with an expedition launch that folds down from the side of the ship, almost like a floating dock. And we launch Zodiacs or inflatable rib boats that our passengers can get in. And that's how we visit these incredible places. Because you're not going into a port, so you have to get there some way. And that is with these Zodiac little ships that go in and actually Get, go on the beach, sort of. Precisely right, yeah. And they're purpose-built um, uh, inflatable, basically rubber boats um, that can get into these places. And we have our specially trained expedition team that can pull these boats up on the beach or onto rocks. And we put out a little staircase and you step off and it's like stepping into the middle of a nature documentary. Truly incredible. <laughs> okay, I have so many questions about uh, this. So I, I guess we'll start with, like, where do you go? Like, is this like people's I'll use the word bucket list, so not my favorite, but a bucket list kind of thing. Like I always wanted to go to the Galapagos, and so you'd be able to take me there. Yeah, absolutely. Many of the places that we go to are, are bucket list destinations, and many of the places we go to are places that you may have been to before, but we're going to show you a different side to it. We, we go to places like uh, Antarctica is probably the destination we're most known for. We've been doing uh, sailing to Antarctica one of the, the longest. Um, and we're the largest cruise line um, in Antarctica. Um, and we have a variety of vessels down there to offer different um, styles of, of uh, cruising in Antarctica. Um, we also do the Arctic. That's actually where we got our start, um, sailing up to Svalbard. See, we're, we're a Norwegian company, and that funny name um, comes, <laughs> comes from our, our humble beginnings. We actually got our start back in 1893, um, oh. delivering the mail for the Norwegian government really? and cargo, connecting the small towns and coastal communities to not only each other, but the rest of the world. And our founder, uh, Richard Wythe, had this um, a brilliant idea that he could connect these towns better than anyone else could with a steamboat. Um, and he did, and he did it. He did it the fastest, and that was called the fast route. And in Norwegian, hurtig directly translates to fast, and rutten translates to root. So, so hurtigruten was the fast, fast route. route, and that name stuck because 130 years later, we're celebrating our 130th anniversary this wow. year. Congratulations! Um, we are we are the fast route. But our, our first mm -hmm. expedition, and we still we have hurtigruten in Norway that still delivers the mail for the government, still delivers cargo, still has that really? traditional route, and then we have premium. Uh, more touristic leisure routes as well on the Norwegian coast. Um, but we did our first expedition in 1896, um, all the way up to Svalbard. Um, and the famed uh, polar explorer, polar captain Otto Sverdrup, actually uh, captained that expedition for us up to, up to Svalbard. Um, and we've been doing Svalbard ever since for over 125 years. So we do Svalbard, we do Iceland and Greenland with some really incredible itineraries. Um, we also uh, sail the Northwest Passage, which is a really unique um, and just incredible route and we uh, we transit the the Northwest Passage and then we have some destinations you may have thought of before you may have been to before like Alaska um, where we sail to Alaska mm -hmm. but we go well off the beaten path in a place like Alaska where we'll go to um, 
you know, in a place like, say, Ketchikan, um, we, we won't stop at the main touristic port that can take up to f uh, four of those bigger ships. Um, we'll go around the backside of Ketchikan um, and we'll get off in our expedition boats and our little zodiacs, um, and we'll we'll go on we'll go on an expedition where we'll go we'll do a landing, we'll do a light hike, we'll go look for bears and bald eagles, and to a place where there's no buildings, there's no people, um, just completely remote areas. Wow. That's um, cool. And that's what we do. That's so you cool. can see more yeah. of the real Alaska. And, and in Alaska, we go to places like we'll go out through the Bering Strait, where they film Deadliest Catch, and um, and uh, through the Aleutian Islands, and and to some places where you're not going to find the other cruise ship. So we, we'll show you the destination in a unique way. And we actually had a, fam, a familiarization trip recently where we had a few travel agents on board, and one of the agents was like, oh my God, I've been selling my clients the wrong Alaska. They all need to go back and see this <laughs> yes. Alaska. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's so, a different Alaska. Yeah, so yeah. We'll, we'll show you more unique places. And we do have some warm water destinations as well. As you mentioned, we have the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can trace the footsteps of Charles Darwin in an absolutely incredible destination. Um, and then we have some, uh, we have West Africa, Cape Verde and Basagos out of Senegal, which is a really unique itinerary. We have the Canary Islands, Madeira, and we also have some unique Caribbean itineraries as well to get you some, to some islands that you, Where you are may the not Caribbean? have thought of before. So um, we, we um, like, I was on one of our Caribbean itineraries. We went to, um, we went to uh, the, um, we went to Providencia, which is part of Colombia, and San Andreas, mm -hmm. Bocas del Toro, which is part of Panama. Um, so uh, we went to uh, Belize, not just Belize City, but we went to um, Lighthouse Key, mm -hmm. expedition style. So we can get to some of the islands that you may not have thought of with, right. with some of our Caribbean Okay, itineraries. so I, I think that when you're doing this kind of thing, first of all, who who does this appeal to? Is it really just younger people? Is it all ages? Like, what if you're an older person who wants to go on an expedition? Is there, do they have the ability to do it? It sounds a little like it could be a little more rugged. Yeah, it, it does sound that way, and and it de we definitely do attract more of your active travelers, um, your clients, the, your travelers who are looking for a more immersive experience than not just your your touristic version of the destinations. Um, but um, we're, we we travel with a focus on science and education, um, and to create that more immersive experience with our expedition team that are scientists that have degrees in something that relates to the field, like um, like biology, marine biology ornithology, um, geology, we have historians on board. So they create that immersive experience and they're also there to guide through your experience on, on land. So you can do as much or as little as you want. Um, rather, you know, if you, you want to go and, and maybe you're a little bit more active and want to do some hikes, you can do that. But if you're, you're not and you want to say do uh, Zodiac cruising or you want to um, look at wildlife from the beach, you know, we have activities that you can do for, for every kind of a physical level ability of, level. Okay. And then the that's most good. the most adventurous part of it is the getting in and out of the zodiacs, right? And that's the thing that intimidates people. And it intimidated <laughs> me as somebody who's boated their entire life. And you know, I, I, I you know, friends and I have a boat on a on a lake up in in Connecticut where I'm from, and uh, I'm on I'm on a boat every weekend in the summer months. But I was a little intimidated by the zodiac, right? Until I did it, um, and then I realized that it, it could not be easier. The way that we have our zodiac launch that folds down to sea level makes it like a floating dock. Tie up the zodiacs, and we have our expedition team in in the boat that that gives that sailors grip to guide you in and then up on on the the launch as well to help you in so I say it's like if, if you can step into a bathtub you can step into a zodiac and on my expedition to Antarctica that I did back in March there was a gentleman in my zodiac group so he was on every launch with me every time we went out in the zodiacs who was 87 years old and he had all of the mobility um, you know, restrictions that you would expect from an 87 year old. He, he moved well, but he moved slower and he needed a little more help. But he was able to get out to these places. And, and you know, when we went and did landings in Antarctica, he wasn't doing the hikes with some of us, right? But he was out on the landings. And when we did a landing in Antarctica, every time we stepped on the beach, there was hundreds of penguins right there. Oh, and cool. we would leave Bob and he'd come back and, and we'd come back and Bob would still be there. And he'd tell us how amazing of a time he had and, and you know, what the penguins did and how he was observing them. So he had an absolutely incredible time. And there are people on board um, of different ages in their 60s and 70s and 50s that have different abilities. And I always say, if, if it, of course, it's that comfort levels for everyone. It's, it is a little bit different. And, and we certainly have, you know, videos and you can see, you can you can see how it is, but um, 
it, it is something that you don't have to be in incredible physical shape to do. And I always do say, and I, I stand by it, if you can step into a bathtub, you can step into a Zodiac and you'll be able to That's a good analogy mm -hmm. yeah, how to yeah. do yes. that. Yeah, Give right. people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I did watch a couple of the videos and okay. the, the one I saw it really kind of featured on a family. So yeah. they were like, Ki you know, kids yeah. uh, doing this, which is actually a great age to, you know, take your family mm -hmm. on a trip like this. Do you find that there is a lot of family adventures that, you know, are popular? It depends on our destination. So for the Galapagos, which is probably the video you saw that mm -hmm. featured the, the, the kids, that's an incredible destination for families. It's incredible for a few reasons. Um, one, because of the destination, uh, because the abundance of wildlife, it's a warm weather destination, um, and, and it's a great uh, destination for kids that are, say, eight to 10 and up. Um, so families with children that are a little bit older um, that are that do want to get out and explore. We do have uh, young explorer program elements into our expedition. So um, there are separate um, paths that kids can take um, if they want to stay out and say, you know, um, everybody else is going back on the boat, but the expedition leader might stay out a little longer if the kids want a little bit more time snorkeling yeah, or a little nice. bit more time on the beach. Um, so we do have activities that cater toward, toward uh, kids on board our, our Galapagos expeditions. Um, we also, in the Galapagos, we have um, cabins that are, are great for families. Uh, we have connecting cabins. Um, we can connect a double to a triple, so a family of five can, can comfortably That's sleep in too. one area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is, which is really great. So that, that destination really lends itself to families with, mm -hmm. with, um, with kids in, say, the, the eight plus range. Um, a destination like Iceland is another great destination for, for families with, with kids in, in that range. And then uh, some of our more remote destinations like Antarctica, um, we see are great for families with, with teenage kids mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and multi-generational trips. Um, it, it really, really fits well for a destination like that. So when you're traveling in the, in the actual big ship to get somewhere, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we think of cruising and you think of those big ships mm -hmm. with lots of <laughs> paraphernalia things and things yeah. to do and yeah. a street in the middle of it and all that. So this ship is not going to be like that. But what kind of accommodations would people expect to find? So the accommodations are very comfortable. You know, our ships are, um, you know, once upon a time you were sacrificing the creature comforts of home to, to go on an expedition cruise to some of these destinations. Um, that's not the case anymore. Our ships are absolutely beautiful, beautifully appointed. Um, the majority of our ships are either are either brand new since 2019 or have been recently updated. Uh, we have two brand new ships, the Royal, MS Roald Amundsen uh, and MS Frigif Nansen that are named after two polar explorers um, that, were, that were launched in 2019 and 2021 respectively. Uh, they were the first hybrid electric cruise ships. Um, so they are sustainable, they're 20% more um, energy efficient um, and uh, we they're also packed with other green technologies as well. But these ships are beautiful with very well pointed staterooms, Scandinavian design, comfortable. Half the cabins have balconies, so it makes it a very uh, lower cost entry point into a, a balcony cabin. Um, they have modern amenities on board, like a heated infinity pool that's heated to 80 degrees, mm. uh, two jacuzzis, wow. uh, a sauna, a spa, a, a fitness center, um, three restaurants on board um, with your meals included, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, beer, wine, and soda included with lunch and dinner, uh, a spacious explorer's lounge where we'll have nightly um, a local musician that will come on board and maybe play piano. Um, we have a bar up there. Um, so it's, it's a more... Um, lower key level of entertainment, but the heart and soul of our program, as I mentioned, with focus on science and education, mm -hmm. is our curriculum, is our science program, um, where, where we have our incredible expedition team members that are going to lead lectures throughout the day. And it's not just the one or two lectures, it's, it's a full program starting at nine o'clock in the morning and going right through to the evening, where we'll host different lectures on the things that you're seeing. So some really um, incredible uh, um, immersion because they're, they're going to speak directly to um, the things that you're seeing on land, but from the science perspective. Talk about like in Antarctica, some uh, snow algae, which is a, a unique phenomenon. So you kind of learn from it. And you know, me personally, I'm a person that appreciates a, a good documentary, but I'm not going home and turning on the Discovery Channel. I'll tell you, I went to the first lecture and I went to every single lecture after it because these uh, these people are absolutely incredible. Their knowledge is incredible and these lectures are super engaging. So that's how we entertain you. We entertain you through education. 
Um, and not just the lectures, we have um, seminars. Uh, we have a science center, state-of-the-art science center with microscopes and other research equipment. Uh, we have uh, bone clones. So if you're, say, in Svalbard and you see a polar bear, we have a bone clone of a, of a polar bear skull. So, um, so our expedition team will take you through and, and show you some of the things that make that unique. And it's not just for that destination. We have it for all of our destinations. A research library. One of the really cool things, we also have a science boat so you can go out on the science boat, the Zodiac, with our, our expedition team, collect samples and bring them back. So in Antarctica, we collected samples, plankton samples, brought them back, looked at them through the microscope that was projected up on the, on the TV screen, and then we weren't sure what one of the plankton was. So we had a research library, grabbed the plankton book, and we flipped through and, and identified what the plankton was. That's so neat. really hands-on, really immersive um, yeah. you know, kind of experiences. Well, that's the whole point of going on an expedition. You're mm -hmm. curious and interested. You want to learn, and it's a lot more interesting and fun if you learn ahead of time and then go out and see it so that yeah. you and then you bring back those experiences and you have that education and the the science lectures that makes it really fascinating and that's great the people who are going on this that's what they want to learn yeah. they want to yeah. learn uh, so that sounds just wonderful so now uh, is this like a big big ship uh, is it is it hundred people? Is it five hundred people? How many you know visitors will you be having on the ship with you? Well, in the world where I think there's a, a ten thousand passenger ship coming out in the there is, yeah. distant future, <laughs> yeah. um, we're not quite that that large. Um, we are, we, are <laughs> we consider ourselves small ship. Um, and um, we, have a, we have a variety of ships that each have their own unique character. And our ships range from um, 90 passengers that sails in the Galapagos year-round, the MS Santa Cruz, up to 500 passengers. The MS Roald Amundsen and MS Richard Nansen, as well as the MS Maud that, um, that sail um, at various destinations in the Antarctic and the Arctic. Um, and then we also have the Spitzberg, MS Spitzbergen, 134 passenger vessel, and the MS um, uh, Fram, which is a 200 passenger vessel. So it depends so, on where you're going, what kind of vessel you'll be on. Correct. Okay. Yeah, it depends on the itinerary you choose. And even in Antarctica, for example, we have one 200 passenger vessel in Antarctica and two, soon to be three, 500 passenger vessels in Antarctica. So. so that's very popular then, in Antarctica, yeah. for people, yeah. if you're doing the 500 passenger. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And it, yeah. With, with a destination like Antarctica, there is, you know, we, we consider ourselves small ship, right? We're 500 passengers mm -hmm. max, so which yeah. when you could put us sit next to some of the really big ships, yeah. It's, yeah. It, we're, we're dwarfed Tiny. in comparison. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but there, that is a, there's a little talk in Antarctica around um, going with a, a smaller ship um, or a little bit bigger ship, and and there are there are advantages to a smaller ship. You have mm -hmm. uh, less people. You can also get out and do more landings by regulation. You can do two landings a day. Um, but the bigger ships, we still get out and we do landings, and we endeavor to get off the ship twice a day with one landing and then one scenic cruise. Um, but the bigger ships, one, they're going to be more stable and, and a little bit, if we happen to come across rougher waters, uh, they also have more modern amenities, like those three restaurants mm -hmm. I mentioned, the bigger state rooms, so the you, half the yeah, state rooms okay. being balcony cabins. So we can still have an incredible experience um, with, with a little bit larger vessel. We also have larger Zodiac launches too, so we can get two Zodiacs out at a time instead of one that, that we do with the smaller vessel. So, um, you know, there are pros and cons to both and there are reasons for it. And that's why we have the diverse ships because there's really a right ship for every passenger. Mm -hmm. I would How think many, it would, oh, oh sorry, sorry, I apologize. <laughs> no, that's okay. I, I wanted to know, is it seasonal though? Yes. Like with weather, you can't just go anytime if you're going to Svalbard, it, yeah. I'm sure there's a time you go there. So with our polar expeditions, we chase summer. So in, in the winter months, our, our winter, we are in Antarctica where it's summer. Um, so we'll sail, our, our, we'll sail from Antarctica in, in our winter months from October till March. And then in our summer months, our ships will reposition and head back and we, we take our time and we have some really unique repositioning itineraries. We're not just a straight shot of some of the uh, repositioning itineraries that are out there. Um, and then we, we go up to the Arctic and then we'll have different vessels that kind of spread out. Uh, one will go to Alaska, one will go to Iceland and Greenland, and one will go up to Svalbard and you know, kind, of, kind of disperse. Okay. How many people fit in a Zodiac? So uh, we have, it depends on the vessel. Uh, some okay. vessels have 12 passengers, some have 16 passenger Zodiacs. Oh, it's so it's a pretty big 
It depends. Yeah, rubber they're, dinghy. they're good size rubber boats, um, and you know you, how you, you step in. We put a little uh, step in the zodiac to, mm -hmm. to help you step in. Although you really don't need it, but it just helps make it a little easier. You sit on the side, and your feet go under the ropes, and then you hang on to a rope, and and it's very, it's incredibly stable. As like I said, as somebody who's been boating my entire life, I was surprised how stable our zodiacs are. Okay. Um, they're made for these types of orders. They're specially designed. Honestly, I don't know how they're designed, but they're. <laughs> They're much more stable than some of the other boats that I've been in, especially when you think of its size. So, uh, Just on a personal level, actually my son and daughter-in-law went uh, to Svalbard. Uh, he probably was on, I'd have to check with him if he did uh, do the, the Hurtigruten, probably. Uh, but, I mean, the, the safety measures uh, that were taken, um, because you're, you're in wild country, you know, you're, you're out there. He they was very impressive. and. I mean, the pictures that he has are phenomenal. I mean, they're absolutely gorgeous. Polar bears and penguins and whatever. I mean, it's just beautiful. And they had a wonderful trip. But I remember him talking about the people on the ship mm -hmm. were from everywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. So they could meet a lot of people. It's That's not just from the United States. Yeah. It's everywhere. Yeah, that's the that's the great thing about about this type of travel in general. And I've been in, I've uh, when I got into the travel industry about twelve or so years ago, I gravitated toward adventure travel. Um, and uh, in this adventure travel realm, you do meet some of the most interesting and incredible people from all over the world. That gentleman, the eighty-seven-year-old Bob that I mentioned, he was probably the most interesting man that I've ever met in my lifetime. Um, and and that's the great thing about travel. This type of travel is is not just the places that you're seeing and they are truly incredible. I look at some of my pictures and I'm like, this is like looking through a National Geographic yes. uh, mm -hmm. magazine and I took right. it with my own right. cell phone. Right, exactly. Um, yeah. And, and yeah, just some of the things that you see, these these are these places that you might not think exist or me growing up as a child, you're like, oh, that's not real. It turns out it is real and that we're, one of the ways that you can get to see it. Um, so, but yeah, that is the great, the great thing is, is just the people you meet on board mm -hmm. and up at the Explorer's Lounge after dinner and, you know, playing cards and board games and chatting with people and, you know, meeting people at lunchtime or in your Zodiac, you just hear their stories about their life, not, not just, you know, fellow Americans, but people from all over the world, which is really one of the great things of, of travel. And, and with a company mm -hmm. like and we have a very diverse clientele from all over the world. Yeah, that, that's what he said. It was really interesting for them in so many aspects. Yeah. And uh, like and I said, these pictures and the uh, stories about the polar bears coming up and watching them and just uh, being p part of an actual Discovery Channel moment, you know, yeah. where you're like, I'm in this now. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. really exciting. It really is incredible. And you mentioned the safety element, you know, our our uh, expedition leaders, not only are they incredible scientists and, and uh, you people that are authors and professors and have really great backgrounds, but they're also uh, trained in polar survival. They're trained by IACO, which is the organization that places tourism in the Arctic, and IATO, which is a similar organization for the Antarctic. Um, so, and, and the measures that they take to make sure that that they cover every contingency is just absolutely incredible. So every time you're going out, they have survival kits and they have you know food that will last you several days and they have everything. They they unload it before you get out there and it's 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 on the beach in case you need it and and they know what to do and what steps to take and and you'll go through some briefings and really see their their knowledge. But they are there to make sure that you're safe and 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 that's one of the differences. One of the things that that makes hurt to gluten hurt to is our experience. You know, we've been do, doing polar expeditions, these destinations, since 1896, and we've been sailing in, in polar water since 1893. Um, but we have the experience to, one, make sure that you have an incredible experience and know where to go if, if with a plan A and a plan B and a plan C if, if weather does change to make sure you have an incredible time. But then also make sure that we're taking the proper precautions to do everything possible to make sure you're safe as well. That sounds great. And I, I guess the important thing is to find out if there's somewhere you want to go, particularly to get in the right season so that you can get to that destination because it would make a difference as to the time of year. 
It's yeah, annoying. and and you know we have of course our great resources and 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 the best kept secret in the travel industry is a good travel agent like Kathy. Thank you. I agree <laughs> with that. Yes, so, I do. <laughs> so Kathy you know, will help guide you to to the right destination. But we also have your know, charts and resources <laughs> to help Kathy look at a destination like Antarctica and bring up the season and say, okay, you know, what's important to you? Is it important to see ice flow? Is it important to see whales? Important to see penguin chicks? Is it important for you to see seals and seal pups and when the best time in that window to go? Like with Antarctica, for example, I think the best time to go is, is in January. It's where you're going to get the warmest water weather. Uh, that's where you're going to get whales. That's where you're going to get penguin and penguin chicks and seals and but if you're looking for potentially seal pups, they're not gonna be there yet. So if there's a client that really wants to see seal pups, you might wanna go a little bit further into February or to March. So there's, there's really that right season and that right window for everyone. For me, it's January, but for someone else, it might be March. Yeah, and it, and it would be good to do your yeah. research with somebody mm -hmm. like Kathy and find out you know, what do you want to see and go at the right time so you're not disappointed. Exactly, Yeah, I agree. It, this, what we're there for is trying to help you get the best out of your vacation that you possibly can get. Because you're spending money, you're spending time, you want your best experience. That's right. That's what we can help with you that. You do, you do. And this seems like a, like a thing where these folks that are deciding to take a trip like this, they've done maybe a lot of traveling and they've figured out what what's missing. What do they want to do next? And it sounds like this is something so unique that it's uh, something it's just like a real dream vacation. And the word vacation is almost like wrong for this because it's, <laughs> it's like you're not sitting on a beach necessarily, but you're, you're, if you're someone who likes to be a lifelong learner, this is just a great opportunity to do that. Yeah, it transcends your typical vacation, I think. Um, and, and really, the destinations that we go to are, are some of the most incredible destinations. A lot of them are bucket list uh, destinations. Um, but they don't have to be. It doesn't have to be hard to get to these places. It doesn't have to be challenging. You know, well, before I started in the travel industry in 2011, I didn't have a single stamp in my passport. I wasn't a traveler. To me, traveling was this dream, right? That maybe one day I would, kind of like owning a Ferrari. I still yeah. have that dream. <laughs> one day I would like to own a Ferrari. But it was, I put it in that in that box mm -hmm. before I started in the industry. And starting in the industry, I realized that uh, you know, it doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be challenging. It doesn't have to be those bucket list places that you'll get to one day. It's, it can be places that you can get to now and you can make that happen. You know, since then I've been to 60 countries and I've been to incredible wow. places like Antarctica. Um, and, um, and the travel industry, it, it opened my eyes that I can go to these places. Um, and, and, and that's, that's what it, it can do. That's what, that's what I want to do is, is show play people places, um, and show people the world for, for those who, who want to get out and to, to see it. So uh, some of these places like Antarctica are bucket list places, Galapagos, um, they're, they're two incredible destinations, but they're two of my favorite destinations. And I'm already plotting my next trip back to Antarctica um, to get back and see it again, because it was that incredible, it was that much of a transformative experience that, that I need to go back. But um, other places are not as challenging to get to, like our, our Alaska itineraries or our Iceland itineraries. We have incredible um, nine night Iceland our nine day Iceland itineraries that are out of Reykjavik which we have great airlift um, flights to to Reykjavik yeah. mm -hmm. very easy to get to from Chicago I think it's a six hour flight so you think Europe is a eight or nine hour flight mm -hmm. it's not even a far flight it's just as long as going to some of the further Caribbean islands and um, it's a really hot destination we're a great way to see it um, and also because we're a more inclusive experience you know we include the, the meals a beer wine and soda with lunch and dinner um, you, the cost compared to a land-based vacation is is usually a little bit lower to to, to sail with her degree so especially in Iceland yeah especially there because mm -hmm. food is very expensive in Iceland yeah. too and so you just circle the whole island yeah so we have incredible circumnavigation itineraries that go around the whole island and okay. we, we make some stops and we do have um, you know with with Iceland it's a little bit more of a hybrid expedition because there are some towns where we actually will port and we do have some inland exploring because there's some great parts of Iceland that you really need to see inland as mm -hmm. well and we, mm -hmm. we include that and we make sure you have the opportunities to see that too but really some of the great parts and I forgot this area but it's the part of Iceland that looks like a reindeer's antlers right the top part 
Really? That's super challenging to get to. And when I went to Iceland, I haven't been with her to Gruten yet, but I went several years ago and I did a land trip and I wanted to go up to some of these places because they're the ones that Iceland uses in all of their marketing, right? And I wanted to get up there and then I realized that from Reykjavik, it's a 14 hour drive to get up there. Oh wow! Whoa. So I'm like, you know what? I don't think I'm gonna get <laughs> up to some of these incredible places that I saw in, in the pictures. With her to Gruten, we'll take you up there because the way we sail, we stop there and you can get off. And, and, and you're so much closer. You're, and you're right there. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. so much closer. So it's really a, okay. a great way to experience Iceland because you can get around to some of these remote places. We also have the, uh, the potential to possibly cross the Arctic Circle too, which cool. Iceland has one little island well above it that does just it? the top part crosses the Arctic Circle, so there's an opportunity to to, uh, to hike up to, to that do part, that too. Yep. so that you can cross cool. the Arctic Circle. So yeah. that's really a great trip, and that's one that doesn't have to be one of these incredible once in a lifetime destinations. You know, and really all of our all of our trips, we, we make it easy to get to, so you can get to these places now and, and not bucket list it for ten years or twenty years down the road. And you know, Glenn, I think that's really key, and we've said it a number of times when we're talking about uh, you know traveling in the world and or in our country, that it's like a don't wait. You know, yeah, you're, you're it's right. really exactly. not, don't do the bucket list thing. Just go, go. out, enjoy, do, do as much as you can, exactly. because why not, you know, if you can save up and, and you know, make that trip happen and not wait uh, until, I agree. It's yeah. sometimes it's just too, too late, late when you wait and wait and wait, you know, you have do it. something just that happens. Do right? it, mm -hmm. get it together and say, I'm going and this, this is, I'm going. There's no better time like the present. I actually, I, yeah. this morning I saw I saw a meme on on Instagram, and I, I have to share it. It was uh, it was an older couple asleep in a gondola in Venice, <laughs> and and it was the gondola guy like you know <laughs> smiling, and these these two older couples are knocked out, and it's like oh, that's the perfect example it. of why why <laughs> you need to travel now. Yeah. Yeah. Don't wait. Get get out and experience. Enjoy it. These. Enjoy Be able to places. share yeah. that with family and yeah. friends of exactly. what you've seen and done. Yeah. Not just talk about going, right? And not do, yeah. do it. Yeah. So Kathy will yes, help you. Yeah. Uh, oh figure yes, out absolutely. Where in the world <laughs> you want to go, and uh, maybe one of the trips is through her to Gruden, and uh, Kathy will help you with that. Kathy, yes. tell us where you're located again. Okay, we are in Worth. The address is six nine four six West one hundred eleventh Street, the corner of one hundred eleventh and Worth Avenue. Our phone number is seven zero eight four four eight six five six zero. We are open Monday through Fridays, 9 to 5. If you need an evening or if you need Saturdays, just call us and we will stay for you. Set it up so that we're there so we can help you. I want to reiterate this one thing. We did this last time, but guys, please, if you're planning anything, get that passport. Make sure it's in order. Make sure you've got time on it because it's taken an awful long time to renew passports right now. And they have to be good for six months beyond your return date or else you're not going. So please pay attention to those passports. Thank you. Yeah, good advice from Kathy. Glenn, thanks so much for coming in today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. It's been fun. It's been, it's been fun to think about. Yeah. And uh, you can learn more through Kathy. Thanks for watching us. We'll be back next month on another travel show where you can dream big and go for it. Thanks for watching us. Bye-bye.